Lack of clearance. Looks yeah. like someone's had a few too many Christmas puddings. Hop out of the car. We'll see if we can get you going again. Are Just you fun. having a go at me? <laughs> Just only a little bit. I'll get the snatch and strap. We'll pop you out in no time. Toby, I give you a hand, except I'm finally balanced here, and I have to stay here and watch it. <laughs> finally balanced, all right. Now, at some point of time, either yourself or someone you know, like Don, is going to get stuck. If your friend is a bit like Don, you'll be getting to know the snatch and strap very, very well because you'll be pulling him out a lot of the time. Now this is the snatch and strap. It works like a ginormous elastic band and it is by far the quickest way to get a vehicle unstuck, particularly in sand. This is probably the most important recovery piece you can ever carry with you on a four-wheel drive. The quickest way to unroll the snatch and strap is to just throw it out like that. This will be my end and the other end will go on Don's end. Next piece we're going to use are these shackles here. Now it's really important you only use rated recovery gear, especially your shackle, because if this lets go, I've actually witnessed a non-rated one braking, flying through the rear windscreen, taking your headrest off, and then flying through the front windscreen. If the person had been in the passenger seat, it would have killed them. So it's really important that you use quality gear. Recovery vehicle, just feed the shackle through there and do it up. Now when you're doing up the shackle, you don't need to do it up crazy tight, just finger tight will do. Now there's a million different snatch and straps on the market. I'll let Don talk about that more later because he knows all about them because he gets stuck a lot. Like any sort of recovery, there's no need to race. So with a snatch here, I'm going to take it off nice and slow to begin with. If that works, beautiful. If it doesn't, then I'll try a little bit harder the next time. Don, you got a copy? Yes, mate. I'm ready. Okay, we'll start turning your wheels now. Where we go. Okay, a little bit harder this time. That's a great example of how snatching can sometimes take three or four goes to get someone out. But remember, it's not a case of bragging or showing how much testosterone you have, even though Don needs some. <laughs> this is something that not everybody knows, but it is important. Snatch straps are made in different sizes. Take, for instance, this range. We have a six ton, got an eight ton, got an 11 ton, and got a 15 ton. They're made like that, so that they can suit the weight of your vehicle. Now the general rule of thumb is pick a strap that is two and a half to three times the weight of your vehicle. Obviously if you've got a small SUV this one might break it in half because it takes 15 ton plus a safety factor to snap that strap and what you really want is the snatch strap to break prior to doing damage to your vehicle. So it's pretty simple. If you've got a thing that weighs two tonne, six tonne snatch strap will get you out of trouble. And up you go, up the range. And that's why they make a range of different sizes. Sometimes a single line winch pull isn't enough, especially if you're really, really good at getting stuck like Don. So if you want to double your pulling power, you're going to need one of these. Here you go, Don. Thank you, sir. You grab the rope and bring it back up, that'll be fine. This is a snatch block, 10,000 kg. It's essentially a pulley with a facility here. You put the rope around it, lock it up, and we can halve the stress on the winch. Here you go, Don. It's on free sport. Thank you, sir. Putting in our winch rope, 
through the snatch block, it's shack a lot. Finger tight, and back off half turn. We'll use two blankets for this. Ready to winch. Now you may not need a snatch block all that often, but it's really important to have it in your kit just in case you do. Because not only will it double your pulling power, it'll also allow you to pull on a different angle. And on that note, if you're using this vehicle as an anchor, just make sure it's firmly secured either at the back or very secure on the ground. A maintenance tip for synthetic rope. This is good stuff, but it gets contaminants in it and that's its Achilles heel. Dirt causes it to wear. So wait, when you finish your trip, Put this in the washing machine with the rest of your dirty clothes. Wash it, air dry it, put it back on. It's ready to go again and it'll last you for years. One of the best pieces of recovery equipment you can take with you on any trip is a high lift jack or a kangaroo jack, particularly if you're traveling by yourself. Now you can store the high lift jack in a lot of spots. Most people tend to favour the rear of the vehicle because that's a spot where you don't really have to access a lot. Keep in mind that I don't particularly like bull dust and it'll get often caught up in the different joins here. It'll stop it from working, so keep that in mind. All right, at the front of the vehicle here, you notice that the TJM bar has a T-piece built into it. Now, a high lift jack isn't gonna be much use to a person that has a modern day vehicle with plastic bumpers front and rear. So having good sturdy bar work, like a TJM bull bar, is really important. Another thing you need, if you're gonna be doing it in sand, is a base plate like this. Because when you're jacking up the vehicle, if you've just got the standard one, it'll sink into the sand. Olive jacks have a million different uses, but you need to pay special care to using them because they have been known to fling back and even whack you in the face, potentially breaking your jaw. Now, when you're using it, it goes without saying, you want to keep it nice and straight and keep in mind the balance of the vehicle. If it's in soft sand, it could fall over, so just make sure you've got an exit strategy. Now I'm not actually stuck here, but you can see the advantages of having a high lift jack if you were. If I was in a big rut or stuck in soft sand, you can jack up either the left hand side or the right hand side of the vehicle at the back, on the side, do a million different things with it. And what you can do when the wheels are up in the air is obviously put stuff underneath it, which can raise the vehicle and help you get out of a sticky situation. TJM stock a wide range of spotlights and basically you can choose between halogen bulb or HID. Now the difference between the two is, one allows you to see a kangaroo from a long, long, long way away, the other one, HID, allows you to see a long, long, long way ahead of you and practically incinerate that same kangaroo. There's a new light kit in town and his name is High Intensity Discharge, HID for short and nothing illustrates the power of the HID light more than when you compare this to my halogen headlamps. These shine down the road a kilometre at least and they don't degrade every time you turn them on. One of the great advantages of a HID light is they use far less power. So there's less drain on your alternator. This is a 50 watt and it just gives you fabulous, fabulous light 
with half the wattage of what we used to use in the halogen lights. Got stuck again, Don. Mate, I've got it right up to the gunnels. But, uh, mate, you're the sand driving expert, so oh. why don't you see if you can get her out? Put the pressure on, don't you? <laughs> Sometimes I reckon you do this stuff on purpose. Could be. In your defence, though, this is the softest track on Fraser. And I see, mate, you've got to fold yourself in half just to get in the front of that one. OK, I'm not actually sure if I'll get out of here, but the first thing I'll notice when I hop in the car is that it's not in low range. Should have been. So what I'm trying to do now is slowly rock the car back and forwards. And you just get a small movement each time until it builds up and up. Now this is much easier to do in a manual vehicle. It's one of the few advantages that manuals have over autos. Mm. Right, Don's actually got himself pretty stuck here, mainly because the Triton doesn't have quite as much clearance as the Troopy. It's really getting belly flopped up on the front. So because I don't want to drive into the soft sand myself here, I might have to join two snatches together to get you out. Don, I'll be back in a sec. Okay. Now, since we're going to join this to another one, I'll roll it another way. Both ends together. Always remember to keep the strap flat. It loses considerable strength once you twist it or get it wet. Getting a strap wet sometimes is not an option. So when there's twists in the strap, it's considerably weakened. Probably 20% of its rated strength goes. Why we are going to put these two ends together, it makes it easy to join this to another strap so we can stand off and not get into this uh, soft stuff. When these two join, if we join them properly and then snatch, we'll never get the knot apart. Hence this little thing. I'll show you how it goes into the knot and it'll enable us to then pull our straps apart after the recovery. Here you go, Don. I see you've even rolled it the, uh, the right way, mate. Strap like that, when you want to join, it's a matter of putting this one through there and this one through there. Toby will then take that. Try and keep it nice and straight and flat. Hence this little fellow. I'm going to put that in the centre of the knot and you'll see that bind up during the uh, recovery. And that will allow us to pull the straps apart. And that is the correct way to join two snap straps. Okay. We're attaching our bow shackle. Okay, here we go. Hey, watch yep. the strap. 